composer originally from Winnipeg, uh, now living in Berlin. Um, I spent the last 10 years in Bristol in the UK, um, and this is the first time I've had a piece presented in Toronto, I think, since 2019. So it's really exciting to be back uh, with the Thin Edge Unique Collective to present uh, Leviathan Poster Club, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So what you see below uh, on the screen, there's like a little thing that says who I am, uh, Thin Edges, and also some like mutual keywords. And this is something that I do at the beginning of every project, which is kind of like, who are the stakeholders and what do we have in common and what do we want to do in this project? So in this case, um, we were thinking about collaboration, innovation, new technologies, and I think what's not on there is also like new structures. So the fan club as a kind of chamber music, compositional creation structure, which I'll talk about. But first, uh, who am I? So, oh, it says UK based here. This is clearly out of date. Um, but I'm a composer, roller coaster designer, and researcher. So before I became interested in music and composing, uh, my first love was designing simulated roller coasters. So I did that for, it, was, it wasn't actually that long of a time. I think it was about three years between when I was like 10 and 13. Um, but I really liked it when I did it. And in a way, it brought me into the way that I would learn to compose music. So I, I was making these roller coasters using online forums to learn how to do it. Um, sort of collaboratively making things and critiquing things of other people's and being critiqued, um, which is actually how I ended up getting into music composition, was jumping forms over to video game music and then engaging in the same kind of collaborative creative processes. So I'll talk a little bit about that as we go, because it's really related to fan culture, which is what this project is about. But here we are 20 years later, and I'm exploring how this sort of early roller coaster love and music uh, can go together in my own practice. And then during the pandemic, I also became interested in AI art creation, which is a thread that sort of runs through a bunch of my projects, including this one. So the concept of Leviathan Coaster Club, and I kind of wanted to look at something that felt problematic to me, which was fan culture, or I felt complicated about. And I wanted to see what happened when me, a composer in an ensemble, form a temporary fan club around something that some of us had been on this roller coaster, some of us hadn't, most of us hadn't been on it at the time. And so during the pandemic, this was in 2021, um, the Thin Edge New Music Collective and I uh, engaged in a week of online research where we formed this temporary fan club discussing Leviathan uh, from Canada's Wonderland. And so the project took place digitally, but now here we are uh, a couple years later, finally getting the chance to actually make an in-person performance out of this week of research um, and kind of ongoing research on my part. So the first thing that I think is interesting to talk about is my own history with fan culture and it's kind of a reckoning. Now it's a reckoning, it wasn't a reckoning at the time. But um, I wanna talk about the kind of cringe of fan culture which is something that I experience. And I don't wanna assume that everyone experiences this because actually something that I'm uncovering as I do this project is that we're all fans of something and also people are hidden fans of things. So it's like the things that I find kind of cringy other people are like huge fans of. So I don't want to assume this is all my own perspective. I don't want to say that this is like the truth or anything. So as a child and as a teenager, um, I was a really big fan of a lot of things. I really liked anime and video games, and they're kind of responsible for how I started doing a lot of things. So I drew fan art. I remember drawing Sailor Moon and Pokemon was kind of the first things that I got into drawing, and that's really uh, what fueled the love of drawing for my entire life. I wrote and read fan fiction, and I even went to fan conventions around anime and video games and stuff like that. So as I was saying before, um, I began making roller coasters as part of online forums, which were really fan forums about roller coasters. And more than just making roller coasters, I was also memorizing a lot about roller coasters and taking part in kind of collaborative competitions and things like that, um, and, and making friends. So I had a lot of online friends on these forums. Um, at the time, I, had, I hadn't really been on any, I'd been on like one, hi, I'd been on like one uh, roller coaster in my life, um, maybe one, I think that West Edmonton Mall, like a, a small one or something, but there was a big moment where like uh, my parents actually took me to Wonderland, which is Canada's Wonderland, at the time Paramount Canada's Wonderland, and I went on my first kind of major roller coaster, and I remember thinking like after designing them for 
whatever it was, three, two or three years at the time, like, what if I, what if I don't even like this? Like, I've just been doing all this, like, designing over and over and over again and, um, you know, really deep into it. And what if I don't even like it, actually? What if I find it too scary or it's just uncomfortable? But I really liked it. And that, yeah, that sort of paved the way for years of riding roller coasters. Um, and then when I began playing music and became interested in music composition, I was really interested in video game music. So I did a lot of arranging video game music, composing kind of like custom music for fictional video games or games that I thought I might make someday or somebody might make. Um, and that kind of continued all through high school. I, I kind of stopped that when I got to university, but it was, a, it was definitely a big part of how I got into composing. The first composing project I did was uh, like a video game orchestral arrangement uh, album, which for some reason, having never composed anything, I was like, yes, I can arrange an orchestra piece. This is fine, uh, which I don't know, I kind of did, but it, it never got performed or anything. But that, yeah, that's how I sort of used these online forums and was um, making fan music for video games. Um, but then at some point, I kind of got quote unquote serious about music stop designing roller coasters and kind of only focusing on activities that I thought of as like moving me forward in my career. So things like orchestra pieces and band pieces and writing for real musicians and very quickly went into like making atonal music. So fully out of the rules of, I mean, even when I did video game arrangements, I didn't know anything about music theory. So I was just sort of like doing things that sounded good. But somewhere along the way, I developed a sort of cringe feeling towards fan culture. And now I have to I have to reckon with like where is that and what is like what is what is it where does it come from, so why the cringe? Um, and these are again these are not truths these are like looking at myself like what are the things that I I'm trying to analyze like what do I find weird about fan culture so it seems kind of decadent so like kind of a waste of time it doesn't lead to monetization which is these are also untrue assumptions but I was like trying to dig into like what I feel. Um, the cringy bits are. So actually fan culture does often lead to monetization, like influencers, view counts, sometimes people publish actual novels. But anyway, fan culture doesn't seem rooted in the real world to me. Uh, it often involves like niche cultural references that kind of separate people away from dominant groups and also bring people together, but it's this formation of subcultures uh, and also relies on minor affects, which is a term from a scholar named uh, Ngai, which I don't know how to pronounced but spelled n-g-a-i um, and these minor affects are things like cute zany and interesting which really lend themselves to things sort of virally passing around now when i put all these in one place i thought does this sound familiar yes contemporary classical music <laughs> all of these things are found in contemporary classical music so a bit of a reckoning then um, not only am I a fan of contemporary music, so I do engage in this subculture of contemporary music, but I also really remain a fan of roller coasters. So the way that I'm thinking about roller coasters in my artistic practice is still rooted in fan culture in a lot of ways. Um, so in my previous work with roller coasters, I've tried to keep things kind of separate. Um, I don't engage with hobbyists. I don't show my work on forums. And I often try to keep the roller coasters uh, abstract and kind of more technical or aesthetic. Um, I didn't. Maybe I maybe maybe I will do this in the presentation. I guess there's probably time. I haven't I haven't put in any of the previous roller coaster works, but maybe I can share some of those a little later. But here I was asking, um, what would happen if I embraced fan culture, and what are the positives? So how is it cool? And for this project, I wanted to research like what what can fan culture do. So, fan culture, transformative, chorus, and empowering. So these are just like a few points as to like what are the what are the interesting things about fan culture and how does it relate to the world of art making and contemporary music. So one thing I found really interesting is that fan culture transforms both the object of attention, so what the fans are a fan of, and the fan themselves. So um, it's possible that both the thing that these fans are a fan of can change through fan culture, but also like the fans can become, say like, they can become more open-minded, they can meet people, uh, have new experiences, it can change people through being a fan. Um, I'm also interested in this idea of kind of a porous barrier, and in this case there's a few ways that happens, but 
one interesting thing for me is like the real and fictional can kind of coincide. So instead of just reading a book and like the book is there and the pictures may be in your head if you see pictures in your head, um, you get to like live in this sort of play space where things like clothes and costumes, food or immersive fan experiences actually bring these two things together, which is kind of interesting when you stop and think about it. Like it's, it's a real, like this barrier between fact and fiction and between the real and imagined becomes kind of more porous, which I find really interesting. But also something that um, in my own compositional work, I think a lot about, which is authorship, um, this porous, porous barrier also becomes, uh, it becomes present when you think about authorship. So fans can change fan objects. And when they do that through kind of mass adoption, belief, creation, um, the, the question of authorship, like who owns it, whether it's an author or a corporation or a group of people, um, it's drawn into question. And so through doing that, fan culture ends up modeling a kind of critical relationship with authority and canon, and it empowers people or can empower people to actively shape a discourse. And then something also interesting to me is that it can create new structures. So you get this idea of a fanon, which is like you have the canon, which is acceptable things by the author, but then you have like a fanon, which is the acceptable things by the fan group and how these things uh, play together or don't play together. The idea of LARPing, so live action role playing, which uh, is often a part of fan culture, but it's this uh, whole possibility of structure of how this relationship between real and fictional occurs. Um, the idea of an open universe, so like the Star Wars open universe where you have um, kind of like a corporate or a business uh, group that's had to accept that fan culture exists and try to find ways to monetize it. So in the case of Star Wars, like there's the official Star Wars universe, which are like, you know, I guess George Lucas and maybe plus a little bit now the movies and things like that. And then you have this open universe where other people write novels that are part of a sort of extended universe, which exists in like a, uh, yeah, like an alternate, but still part of the universe kind of way. So all these things are really interesting when I think about music, which I'll get to. So a few kind of inspirations in art making. Um, one, when I think about contemporary classical music is Nicole Lise, um, and she makes works that remix. So it's, I guess it's more like a remixing, but they're really like, you can tell that she's a real fan of these cinematic works that she's remixing. Um, and something particularly that arises out of this is that there's a real problem then in, particularly in online presentation where She's used, say, like a parts of Hitchcock films, and then it becomes a problem to put it on YouTube because it's like there's still parts of Hitchcock films, even though in the art world, like this kind of porous situation of authorship is like much more familiar. But when you get to the actual uh, world of like monetization, it becomes more of a problem. Um, one that recently I heard about that I really liked is uh, this author Elvia Wilk, who um, actually used the structure of LARPing to kind of LARP the end of her novel for herself to write. So she got a bunch of people together and like put them in this uh, building and then gave them all the sort of rules of her novel world and had them improvise in the world. And then she drew storylines and plot points from that and put them into the novel at the end. So I think it's just like so cool, the idea that you sort of take your own authorship and then farm it out to a bunch of people who are like play acting get ideas and then bring it back to your own creative practice. Um, and another one is, which is more related to roller coasters. I was trying to think of like, is there a roller coaster kind of fan art situation? But um, Cory Doctorow uh, and his novel Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, which is a kind of fictionalized Disneyland in the future, um, which is experimenting with kind of these alternative political structures. I think it's called like a ad hocracy. So it's, but it's all really rooted in fan culture where he's like thinking about the sort of Disney world and the way people are obsessed with it, the ways that it could be monetized, the way that it could be become like its own political country and its own political faction and um, yeah, playing with all that. So I've, it's not like a, in a way that's not like a fan object, but it kind of is because it is about Disney world, but it's like very much about fan culture. So sounds pretty exciting to me. How do we make a roller coaster fan club slash chamber music hybrid? So um, what we did is we spent a week online together because we were in the pandemic and fan clubs are very at home online. The first thing that I did is I made this discord. So it's a 
kind of an online place where people can come together um, and send messages and pictures and attachments and things like this. Um, and I made a Discord for the space and got everyone at Binet to come onto this Discord. So this is like step one, we're all in the same kind of space every day. Um, and then made a structure for us where each day we would meet for a few hours. There was kind of like little homeworky bits, fan, fan homework, I guess. And then near the end of the week, we had sort of time with instruments to figure out like, okay, how does this really become music? The first, uh, the first kind of activity we did was uh, fan presentations. So I had everyone in the group research Leviathan, the roller coaster that we were uh, making our kind of fan, fan project about. And it was super interesting because I actually then went and did some research. And particularly for me, I was interested in um, looking at the history of the land itself, where Wonderland is, but also something that came up, I think it was in my research, was the sound of the roller coaster because the company that makes Leviathan, b &M, um, the roller coasters are super loud because they have a hollow metal, they have a hollow sort of center tube or box. Um, and they're just so loud that I think it's with Leviathan they figured out that they could like put sand in that center thing to dampen the sound, which makes it a lot quieter. But it's like, of course, kind of impossible to do it retroactively to a roller coaster, though I think they managed it now. But you sort of have to do it like piece by piece, taking it out, putting the sand in, etc. So it's super interesting. But everybody, everybody did this kind of research and I was super surprised at, I mean, it's like the first time in my life that I've spent time with any people that are like doing the same thing that I do about roller coasters. So like, it was kind of crazy when, you know, Cheryl and Alana, Nathan, Amal, and Terry all sort of came with these facts and things about life and things that I didn't always know, or even just um, trying to reconcile with like these terms of what, like, what a roller coaster is so like okay the statistics like is it a hyper is it a mega coaster what are all the elements called how does it traverse through the track and like all of these kinds of things so it was really fun to kind of bring us all together and do this research and learn more about leviathan and i think it set uh, a good course for the for the rest of the fan club experience so another thing that we did then was based on memorizing the path of Leviathan, which for some reason I just, I was really interested in whether we could memorize how it felt to go through this roller coaster. Um, and I'll show you in the next slide after I'm kind of done talking about, well, maybe I'll go there now. Um, is it gonna come up? So I made, uh, for this memorization, I made this roller coaster hypnosis video, which is 20 minutes long. I'll show you uh, a bit of it. We can watch, uh, we can watch some of it. It also has a really, it's funny that the sound is actually really interesting because it's not high quality, but I found it pretty cool. It's just like a row, low rumbly boxy thing. But yeah, basically we watched this uh, on ride footage of a full run through of Leviathan. And then I'll show you what happens in the video as it goes. Basically, let's see if we can jump a little later. It starts uh, fading away. And then eventually, as you can see here, you start getting periods where it whites out. So you're supposed to keep imagining riding it as you're going. And you can see the yeah, periods of it fading and whiting out kind of get, uh, yeah, get more and more. And so the idea of this was that maybe after about 20 minutes, we might like, oh, let me get into the, let's see the presentation again. Right, so the idea was that maybe after after watching it for this 20 minutes, like we might, uh, we might start to memorize it. And I was kind of interested in that because I wanted to then play with how we could perform that memorized path, um, which I'll get to a little later. Um, but then the next kind of significant, um, yeah, the next significant thing was that we, I wanted the group to actually make some fan objects. So I sort of assigned this homework of like, okay, go away, make something about Leviathan that's, uh, that's a fan object. So it could be like fan art, fanfic, fan sound, fan other, which th there was some fan other stuff. Uh, and I also went away and made some fan stuff. So I'll show you a little bit of those uh, on, the next, on the next slide. But I was, I was really blown away when everyone came back uh, two days later and had these fully realized fan objects of a roller coaster, which um, it's really interesting looking out there 
uh, sort of fan things about roller coasters. Like roller coasters, people tend to be fans of in the way of like you know they um, they chart their rides of them. They go to different parks together. They like you know they keep logs. They share photos. This sort of stuff. But like fan objects around roller coasters are a little bit less common. Though now um, I've noticed on my Instagram al algorithm, I get a lot of fan recreations of like three D printed roller coasters. Which up until about two years ago, it was super difficult to do. But it must be that 3D printing has just gotten so much better that now people can actually print all the little bits. And so I'm seeing a lot of um, fan printed recreations, which is new. But in terms of like fan art, there's a little bit out there. Um, and fanfic, there's a few. And it's it's pretty, I mean, fan roller coasters feature in a lot of fanfics. I did a, like a sort of survey of things. And, you know, lots of people place the characters of other fandoms into roller coasters and stuff. But actual like, fandom about a roller coaster, a little bit less common, but there's there's examples. I have a few on my computer that I can link uh, people if they're interested in, but um, out, they'll also be on the Discord, which I'll mention later. But yeah, there's a few like fanfics about the personified roller coasters, or sometimes unpersonified, but just the roller coasters themselves. Um, so I didn't know what people were going to come up with. and. They, yeah, we had a fan, well, you'll see in the next slide, but we had, we had a, a variety of fan objects. And then finally we got to the end of the week and it was like, how, how does this become music? Now that we've all really familiarized ourselves with this roller coaster, we've like memorized it, we've made fan objects, we've done research, we're all like in this fan space and how are we gonna do some music making? Um, and the first thing that happened is we sort of realized like, Zoom at the time was not adequate to actually make music together online. So it wasn't going to be a situation of like everyone has their instruments and they're going to play at the same time. So it was going to be more recorded, um, recorded, everyone goes away and records something, which actually served me a lot better in the end because I ended up using all the recordings in the live uh, thing. But um, so the first, the first way that we made some music, which is something that I've experimented in with other projects um, about simulated roller coasters is that we use this memorized path and we assign some kinds of mappings so things like pitch and height or speed and volume uh, I think in this case we use speed or g-forces and timbre so we did these kind of experiments where each person would go away and use their remembered version of the roller coaster and ride through it in their brain while they're playing their instrument doing this mapping between pitch and, and volume and g-force and things like that. And then what was particularly interesting is to take all these, and this is where doing it individually actually was maybe more interesting than doing it together, is that each person's wasn't super lined up. Like when I superimposed them all, they were kind of there. You could see the peaks and valleys of the roller coaster, but like not perfectly lined up, which as a composer, I think we're always often interested in things that are not perfectly lined up like that. So it was actually really cool. Um, and then I think the second musical thing I did, which didn't make it into the, uh, the final piece was that I gave them, well, it, it didn't away actually, but I gave them this like mega difficult transcription of some uh, weird carousel music. And then they all played the notes of the transcription and just adjusted their speed as for the roller coaster, um, which was, I think really difficult because it's like, you're watching this stream of notes go by in your musical notation and you're also trying to like speed and slow yourself um in your in your head as you're like thinking about this roller coaster but this is the kind of like spread of activities we did which then like led to the to the piece and now i think i have uh, that's the video and then oh yeah the fan object so um Cheryl made a knitted version of the Leviathan track, which I just like that I would have never, 100% never thought of doing. So that was like first number one going, whoa, okay. Um, Elana made a soundscape that was based on some of the recordings I think from that uh, video and then some improvisation as well. Um, Terry made a piece of fan art, which was great. You'll see it in a moment. That actually became a t-shirt for everybody. So we have a kind of a, unofficial official fan t-shirt for the, for the fan club. And Amal wrote a fanfic about Leviathan, um, which this one was kind of the most challenging to integrate into the final piece because it's a, it's a longish fanfic. Um, and the kind of gist of the fanfic is that like Amal took the idea of the Leviathan as a mythical creature, 
Um, the fanfic starts as if it's like three knights that are going to attack the Leviathan, and then there's like a little twist where you realize like they're actually going on the roller coaster and they're really confused why it isn't like a, a beast. So they get to the end of it and are like, oh, we had fun, but we want to kill the beast. Where was the beast? So it's like a, a, a cool little twist to it. It was a really nice little fanfic. And then Nathan uh, made this pure data patch that took, essentially I had a G-force graph of the roller coaster, which it looks like a sinusoidal wave, and he turned it into a, 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 a waveform for a synthesizer that then he played some notes on on the keyboard. And myself, I made an AI-assisted text that was a kind of fictional version of Leviathan, which is something that I've been really interested in for a while is I've, I've taken essentially all of Wikipedia's roller coaster entries and trained uh, trained an AI model to generate fictional roller coaster entries. So I can kind of like type in Leviathan is a roller coaster and then it finishes the entry uh, as per its uh, strange, strange logics. So that was all, yeah, these were the fan projects that gave me lots to think about for the for making the piece. Um, here's some pictures of the, uh, yeah, the fan t-shirt, cool. Cheryl's knitting, um, I can, I'll, I'll bring up a video of some of the rest of the piece, so I'll show you some of the other fan objects too, but they're all in the final performance as well. Um, so then, fast forward two years, how do I make this uh, week of fan experience into an actual piece for performance? And in a way, like, there were some big questions of how does it exist in time at all? Like, it's a fan club, it's an experience we had, how does it even become a 10 minute piece? when it doesn't it doesn't exist in this form so i had to i had to kind of like narrativize it and section it and and in a sense that's when i'm like doing the work of a composer which is like organizing sound organizing ideas so in terms of what the piece is um and maybe as i do this part i'm going to show some little bits of the actual piece itself so in the first section what I wanted to play with was just this idea of a lift hill because it's the, the roller coaster experience is broken into a few bits which are all proportionally really interesting. You have the line, which is proportionally the longest part of the roller coaster experience, generally, unless you're lucky. You're standing in line for like an hour. Then you have the lift hill, which proportionally during the ride is the longest part of the ride. Generally, like at least half of the ride is spent on the lift hill. And then you have the shortest part of the whole experience, which is like the fun part of the roller coaster. So this sense of proportion I thought was really interesting. And I wanted to actually use the same without the line. The line thing, I still want to figure out a way to put it into a piece, but I don't know. It's like such a long proportion. But in this case, I thought, OK, the proportion of the lift hill like being sort of half-ish of the experience could be really interesting. So I wanted to make this lift hill that goes on for a really long time. Um, and in that. I also wanted to use the recordings that we made uh, from the original uh, workshop and kind of have this phantom ensemble, pandemic ensemble playing with the ensemble. And so they're in the recording, they're playing uh, different notes. So I just kind of made a pitch thing as a composer. Sometimes you do, you just make a nice thing that sounds good. So I made some pitches that sound good to me. And uh, yeah, so we have this first section where we're just, uh, you won't hear the real ensemble here, of course. Um, but yeah, as we go through this section, it's like just, uh, I'll skip a little. So we're just like going up forever. So we just keep going up. I tried to find really good splice points in the video. So it's just like, we're just gonna keep going. And then as the section goes, um, let's see. Play with the speed of the lift a little bit. Here it's going backwards and forwards at the same time. And then, kind of as we get to the end of it, uh, playing with like multiple superimpositions. And I was thinking about like, I don't know, things like Kubrick and symmetry, though it's not super symmetrical because of where the thing is in the video. But anyway, um, this is the first section. There's also a text. So I kind of made mo Ooh, that's not the right browser. I made most of the piece and then realized that it it needed something to hold it all together and in a way to introduce the audience to like what what is this? And I thought important this is something that's come up in other pieces that I've made where it's like how do you bring the audience into the actual space of the piece? And in this case it's like how do you make them part of the fan club? So 
the text is a kind of weird poetic induction ritual into the fan club. So it, it through the whole piece kind of um, contextualizes and ritually uh, induces the audience to become a part of the fan club, which I've, I've been interested in a lot of pieces, this kind of like transforming the audience through text and through uh, recordings. Um, in one piece I used kind of a spell where the roller coaster, there's like a spell that transforms the audience into a roller coaster. Uh, and in this case, it's like something that yeah brings them into the fan club, which I think provides a good context, I guess, for for the for the piece itself. And then in the second section, um, this is where so originally I used a sort of carousel sound, which I thought was really interesting. This old timey theme park sound. Theme parks nowadays don't sound old timey at all. They sound like Muzak, like it's just like so much Muzak playing at you, which. Um, in the in the pandemic version of this piece, there was like a big work in progress that was like 30 minutes long and there was lots of music in it, but didn't make it into here. Still in the future, I'll have to explore it. But yeah, I'm sort of interested in this like old timey carousel thing. Um, and at the same time as doing this, I've been exploring AI music creation. And one of the one of the tools, which is called Rave that you can use, um, where you can train your own sound model and then pass sound through it essentially, or so you can like make, say, uh, I don't know, my voice sound like a vintage jazz band recording, or you can make like a flute recording sound, whatever. So you can do that kind of thing. But then you can also um, take this model, which is essentially like a, it's like a set of parameters. It's a computer that's learned the parameters of what makes this certain kind of sound. So in, this, in the case for this piece, I used a model that's trained on vintage jazz pop standard sort of recordings. Um, and what you can do is instead of passing other sound through it, so instead of saying like, I'll transform the flute into the vintage recording, um, you can directly kind of um, input essentially like numerical instructions for where inside of those parameters to go in the model. And so what I was able to do is actually input kind of rhythms and things, but without putting in sound itself. So what I got was this very like jagged rhythmic object, which then, and I'll play you a little bit of that, which then I, transcribed, um, I essentially orchestrated like the parts that I heard and found really interesting and the ensemble ends up playing those. So you won't hear the ensemble in this recording, but I'll show you a little bit of like what this sound world is like. <laughs> So you can imagine, uh, even I think if you hear that, you can imagine how difficult this is going to be for the ensemble to play perfectly in time. Uh, and also I wasn't really thinking about there's this problem where I wasn't thinking about rhythm. It's not like a composed, this is an AI that kind of made this sound recording, even though I was inputting um, like parameters for what the rhythm might be, et cetera, et cetera. Like it just fits out of a, a sound. And then I kind of have to deal with it. So the first thing I did was um, essentially pick the parts that stood out to my ear, which actually now when I'm listening to it, it's like, they're not, they're just what stuck out to my ear. I don't know, Alana, maybe do you hear like what you're playing in that? Um, part bits and pieces. I think just because there's so much other texture going on, like your ear yeah. gets drawn to different things. Like yeah, and I think each time you listen to it, I think everybody would hear kind of different things. Yeah. But what I ended up doing is the parts where the video flashes red are like the events in the sound that I found really interesting. So I kind of first edited the video, put all these red flashes in of like, okay, this are these are the hit points, and then. Uh, the challenge was like, okay, how, do, how is the ensemble actually going to play this? So um, I've been using a, a coding language called R, which is a, a, a data, data representation coding language. And uh, so using R, I essentially, I've developed a code that I can put in um, edited video from, or I can put in video from a timeline in Premiere and it kind of, uh, it basically like just 
makes a graph of where each uh, clip starts. So I can, the nice thing about that is I can like make something in Premiere, then instead of having to like write down all the times where each clip starts, and in this case, like the clips are all the red flashes, which would have taken me, there's like 200 flashes or whatever, it would have taken me a long time to write down each time. So anyway, R just like spits it all out. And then what I can also do in R is I can set it up to look a bit like a musical score. So I can put, you know, bar lines or uh, divisors on each uh, 60, on each uh, second, for example. And then within each second, what I ended up doing for this is I divided each second into seven, six, five, four, three. So I had dotted lines of different colors for all these divisions. And then I would like look at each clip starting point and look which one it was closest to, and then that's where it appears in the music. So, they, so then the ensemble gets this precise rhythm of how they're gonna play these flashes of color on the screen. Um, which are other composers certainly could have done this differently. I know there's loads of ways to do this. For me, it's like, so th there'd be ways of like changing the time signature with like doing all this stuff. For me, it was like easiest to imagine if it was all just like tempo equals 60. I'm not thinking about where the downbeats, et cetera, are. It's just like, and I, I, in a way, like it comes out in the music in that the, where the downbeats are in each of the measures affects how the players perform it. But I'm not like, I don't, I don't mind that or anything. But I think in the end, it's working pretty well. The ensemble's playing really well. So, uh, but it's hard. It's like the rhythms are really complicated, syncopated, like, you know, sevens and fives and switching between all these things. So um, I knew they could do it, but it's a challenge and they're doing it great. So um, then uh, the third section of the piece is where I wanted to make space for these FEM presentations that the ensemble members had given. So I wanted to like actually hold space for like what we had done. So you can see in the, in the recording, uh, I'll just skip through. So you just, you get like little credits as to who did what. You see Terry's t-shirt, you see Cheryl's knitting. The, the rock. Um, you see Nathan's pad. Nathan can go through two retractable hills, either uphill. See his little synth thing, and then you get a bit of- Galen thinks we're to be gleaming through you have. And you get a bit of Amal's uh, fan, fanfic. So that was, it was really nice to like bring these things together. It'd be interesting, like I was thinking about yesterday, like, okay, what is it, what happens if another ensemble plays this piece? Like, <laughs> what do we do? Do we have to make a new fan club? Maybe, maybe we do have to make a new fan club. Maybe it becomes a part of doing this piece where like then this section of the piece always becomes the sort of fan object part of the ensemble. And like, in a sense, the kind of roller coaster research fan objects becomes like a, a collaborative research rehearsal situation. Hopefully I get to try it out someday another ensemble wants to do it. Um, the fourth section of the piece then is a, <laughs> no, I just said it yesterday, now I can't get it out of my head, this Pavan for Leviathan. So it's like a very dirgy uh, song uh, that I actually sang to my microwave, which, uh, don't ask, I don't know. There was, a, <laughs> there was a microwave that sounded really good and I was singing along and I was like, I should really record this just in case. And I didn't know why. And then uh, two weeks later I was making the piece and thought, the microwave recording. This is, and this is how composition works. Uh, so you'll see, and then I pair it with this like very, uh, again, using AI, I'm able to do all, all sorts of things now, like upscale the video and slow it down. So you get this sort of very, section of the pieces where we actually did bring in this really difficult transcription of music that people play while they're thinking about or watching the ride through the roller coaster so they're adjusting their tempo for the roller coaster and in this case um, just two members of the ensemble so Cheryl um, on piano and Nathan on percussion so Cheryl is playing uh, a stream of very complicated notes that are all based on that microwave recording, but like transcribed very uh, using Melodyne, so it makes a MIDI that's just like all over the map, crazy, crazy. So Cheryl's playing this thing, and Nathan's playing a fully improvised drum solo, which I can't take credit for at all, but it's going to be a really good ending. Um, they play together and sort of see the video out, and that's um, yeah, that's like the whole piece as it as it was made. Um, and the final aspect of it is that I also wanted to open up the fan club to the audience, which I'd really hoped to do before 
the performance, but it turns out writing a piece is enough of a challenge, let alone uh, making a fan club. So I think what's going to happen is we'll sort of officially open the fan club um, with the audience at the concert. So there's a Discord link, which now that I'm thinking about it, can go in the video, we can take a picture, this is uh, <laughs> easy enough. Um, and then, yeah, the, this sort of Leviathan fan club will exist for whatever, a few months, uh, and we'll see what it means to kind of open this whole process up to audiences. And maybe in future versions of the piece, um, there'll be an integration of this kind of audience aspect. I was really, and hopefully I'll be able to do it, I'm excited about the idea of like making a zine, for example, so going from this kind of digital thing back to a physical, like little book booklet project or something like that. Um, but yeah, finding a way for the audience to be brought in. And I think the first step is in this live performance, like sort of unofficially inducting everyone to this fan club, but then, yeah, providing space where they can actually uh, join in. And then, of course, figuring out, yeah, how, how does this piece live live on and, and what happens? Besides me writing Leviathan someday, I've still never written it. I think the whole rest of the ensemble went to... Did everyone? Yeah. Yeah, we all went to Sebastian. Right? So yeah. yeah, they're they're amazing uh, and did their homework really well. Uh, and I'm still the one who <laughs> has not actually written written Leviathan. It was kind of in the pre-pandemic version of the grant and the funding for this piece. It was actually like I was going to come. We were going to do research days at Canada's Wonderland and ride the roller coaster. Uh, but then <laughs> pandemic happened. That didn't happen. I did end up going to a theme park in the UK with uh, a group of musicians, and it was super weird like it's indescribably weird to go to a theme park with like the intention of not being at a theme park to enjoy the theme park but to like do musical research so I come up with some kind of scores uh, little experiments that we do mostly with listening on on rides but it was really challenging and challenging as well because within the ensemble because we weren't making a piece really it was like there's really different levels of people who wanted to be there or not wanted to be there they all kind of wanted to be there but different like levels of engagement with roller coasters in general like I think Thin Edge like you guys all like roller coasters we, we did but I hadn't been on one since I was like 20 so I was curious yeah. how I was and it was it was more I had fun but it was like the Leviathan because it's a giga coaster was like that drop was a lot it was good I would do it again but it was like it was so yeah it's, <laughs> it's a lot but like for example in this ensemble that we went to the theme park with um, one of them like doesn't just doesn't ride roller coasters so it was like okay we'll find ways that she can um, listen and um, observe and then with that group we ended up doing kind of two days of like uh, or we did a day of workshop workshop making and just like trying things out but anyway separate of me actually going to the theme park so otherwise though I think it's all it's all kind of happened in the best way that it could um, yeah that's more or less all I have to say for now about this, the performance of uh, the pieces, I mean, we're on the live stream here, so uh, the performance will have been or was, is tonight time, uh, and uh, will also be, um, it's been recorded and will be released uh, by The Thin Edge as an album on Bandcamp, I think in winter, right? Yeah, we're also live streaming tonight, right. and there will be a link of that, like a permalink, so. I right, okay, so we'll be live streaming tonight. There's also going to be a permalink, so yeah, people can, people who are interested can check it out uh, that way as well. So yeah, thanks for uh, coming and streaming and watching this later. Uh, yeah, it's been really fun to kind of unpick all these feelings about <laughs> being a fan and not being a fan and, and what that means. So hopefully it's yeah, interesting to you and maybe we'll take any questions that are in the room if there are any questions. For everyone else who's on the stream, um, if you want to join the fan club on Discord, just uh, write to me at this email address. Um, I can definitely put a, a Discord link, but um, yeah, just write me and we'll get, we'll get you involved. Uh, and if you have any questions or uh, thoughts about roller coasters, etc., yeah, just get in touch. But yeah, maybe some questions in the room if there are any questions. There don't have to be any questions, but. Yes? Do you think that fan culture is an underexploited or has uh, has potential that's underexploited for arts education. One hundred percent. Yeah, some of the research that I did. There's actually quite a lot of uh, academic research into using fan culture as like a classroom tool. Yeah. Um, because it's like such a such a good in point for students because 
and, and I'm sure you experienced this with students who are like making video game arrangements and things like that. Well, I was the same as you. Yeah. I, I cut my orchestrational teeth doing video game arrangements. Yeah. And then distance myself from them, but still love them. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think I think both of both of our generation and the future generation, like so many so many people are going to come in through this kind of route. And I think even with even with writing say fan fictions in an English class or making fan art, like all of it first provides a really easy route in. So it's like suddenly like students are making something that they care about because it's like related to something that they care about. But one one book I was reading, which is where I got some of the kind of ideas about um, challenging relationships relationships to authority, like inherent to this kind of making is that you have to understand and question a relationship with authority because like doing a fan thing is strictly speaking in the way that authority works in the world is sort of runs contrary to that like an author makes something uh depending on how you think of uh roland barth the the death of an author but like an author makes something and it's like that that is understood to be their kind of thing and so when you make a fan object you're going against this like entrenched structure so i think using that for students can be really interesting as well because they then have to like assess where the power structures are what it means to run against them also like where your own biases and interests lie so yeah anyway i think it's super interesting and, and in arts education as well i think like certainly in band choir etc like absolutely you're going to see and we, we do see particularly like marching band in the united states but like video game arrangements anime arrangements movie arrangements like it's all it's all there but i think particularly like the fan club or or these other fan objects like certainly fanfic and fan art i would say are like less acceptable in the classroom currently but i think they're really powerful uh yeah educational tools does that answer your question mm -hmm. great any other questions i can think of baseball example <laughs> yeah <laughs> I thought I, I'd never thought of it as when you a, a, a group of fans can change the the object, and so I thought, okay, well, it, you know, the most right now is I'm here to see a baseball game, so I'm a baseball fan. But how do I, as a fan, change the baseball game? Like that doesn't happen. But hey, wait a minute, it does. They just changed a whole bunch of baseball rules this year because of fans you know people complain the games are too long so they put in things now to make the game shorter so it did yeah and it exists because of the fans if the fans stop being there the game the object just disappears the, the team can't exist so if the fans stop the game stops that's that yeah. it's a really interesting concept yeah but the, even even and i think What's interesting about that is like, of course, in that scenario, it's also, I mean, I don't know specifically how that thing happened, but it's like, it's also really beneficial to them to change that rule. So it's like, whoever changed the rule is like saving tons of money, the stadium can be open for less time, less employed people, like it, the whole thing becomes, it's like, that's probably a case where most people win, except for maybe people like my dad who want to be at the ball game for eight hours <laughs> instead of two, but most people might win out of that kind of thing so that's that's a case where maybe who knows maybe there's contention around it maybe some people are really upset but I think it sounds like a sort of most of the stakeholders fans kind of win on that one um, I have one more question yeah so this one's about roller co the experience of roller coasters as a form mm -hmm. to be explored mm -hmm. so this is a story with a question mark at the end to sort right. of more to understand what you think I'm not even gonna pretend that this is a normal question sure um, when I go to an amusement park, as someone who loves roller coasters, I specifically seek out the intersection of, of parameters that allows for zero line days. Yep. So that's a yeah. 10 a.m. misty <laughs> but not raining. Yeah. So the park is empty, yep. but the rides are running. Not school holidays. Not a school holiday. Yep. And I've gone on, you know, 15 roller coasters in an hour to the point where you're completely physically destroyed and yes. sick for the rest of the day. Yes. So do you think that the line uh, is an important part that I'm just not getting? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it 
su no super interesting question actually. <laughs> uh, so first I'll say best laid plans can go wrong. So when I took this UK ensemble to a theme park, for example, we went on a weekday rainy day and it was it was 10 degrees and raining. Uh, so it should have been by all accounts the worst day to go, not school holidays, and it was full. So we both were in 10 degrees and rain and also <laughs> waiting three plus hours. We went on three roller coasters in the day, which was just the most brutal day. It was like hard to keep the joy going. Uh, so, but also recently then I, I got it really right. Um, I was in San Francisco and went to Great America and yeah, played it all right. It was actually a sunny day, but it had some rain and like, yeah, didn't I didn't wait in a single line. And similarly, like I actually only needed to be at the theme park for like, three hours because as, as an adult I think this is where it's like different as a kid as an adult you have a limit that's like suddenly you get to the headache limit and you're like nope got a headache that's not going to go away I've jangled myself around way too much so I think the lines do serve as kind of important I mean they also they generate all sorts of revenue for the park as well through those line skipping things like they're, they're part of this sort of environment um do I like I don't know if I I enjoy a day where I'm not waiting in line because also there's really special I think for me the most special experiences at a theme park are when you get to go on a roller coaster and stay on and just like go around ah. multiple times and that's where this idea for the kind of roller coaster hypnosis video came from because in doing that you start to memorize the roller coaster as you're going around it and you're like oh this part this part and then actually after the day is over you can often like shut your eyes and kind of feel the weird gravity effect of this roller coaster. So I too like a day with no lines, okay. but I'm interested in that like lines are sometimes a part of it. And and for a lot of for a lot of people, like particularly families, etc., who do, you know don't get to choose to go on this, you know, mega rainy, yeah, it's misty, etc. Like the lines are just gonna be a part of the whole experience. So yeah. That's a, a a complex non-answer to a uh, kind of non-question, <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. But yeah, lines are a part of it, but they don't have to be. There's good, good and bad. Would change your experience, but yeah, I mean, you definitely wouldn't. I mean, you wouldn't get up against the headache uh, <laughs> situation. I think I had a concussion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was sick for days <laughs> after that. Yeah, I and I sort of staggered out of the park. <laughs> And I was only there for maybe an hour and a half. Yeah, it's crazy when you can just go on them. I think for me, I didn't. Well, it was it was not three hour lines. It was like hour and a half lines. But like there was this nice social aspect of us like mm. anticipating. I mm. uh, maybe like a little mm. less time between. Yeah. Like a little time to be like, okay, we're waiting. We're seeing. Yeah. We can see. We're getting closer. We're getting, but but uh, the three hours is like yeah so maybe like a, a, a twenty minute line yeah I can be twenty minutes to nice half an hour to the, the punchline of the ride yeah, yeah if we could curate the ideal and then towards the end of the day it empties out so yeah. you can have those yeah. stay I mean that's for example La Ronde I think that often happened where it's like the end of the day kind of over and everyone had left and then I was left on the wooden roller coaster Le Monstre by my, you know with a friend and we would just go around and like get a headache. <laughs> I, there is a sort of a weird state that can happen that's only happened a few times once on Ednor, where you're you've gone on it five times in the loop, and then you st and all the fear starts to disappear. Oh, fully. And you're just totally relaxed, and there's no anxiety. Same thing with uh, Goliath, uh, Goliath. Yeah. In, uh, in La Ronde, but Leviathan here. Mm -hmm. Imagine going on that one six times in a row until all of the fear is totally gone and you're just kind of paying attention to the nuances of the free fall. <laughs> that was the part that I think was the, the, yeah, I can't, that would be quite something. <laughs> I would say, it, and that's maybe kind of ride dependent because the, the last one that I went on five or six times in a row was this one at Great America. And it's like a really good, it's a really well-designed roller coaster and it's just like the forces on it are so great that you it's like you're every time they're still like Wah! like it's still uh, it's smooth or it's not it's, smooth no it's really smooth but it's like the forces are very extreme ah. so it's like you're really pulled out of your seat in like an extreme way and pushed like so it kind of 
even though being on it multiple times, like you lose the fear, but you're you're still very much like affected by the. But I had I've I've definitely had that experience, and it was one thing we talked a lot about at this like theme park research trip with musicians, where it's like the first time, the first roller coaster of the day, you almost like couldn't. In fact, you couldn't think. It would like actively inhibited any thinking once you're over the hill. Whereas even going on the three or four that we went on, like by the end of the day, you don't really have the same kind of like fear factor. So you're a little more used to everything. But yeah, I'm still I'm still working on ways of thinking about incorporating all of these things into like musical forms and musical ideas. I have one one suggestion, maybe a thing to try. Sure. And that's enough out of me. The um, the closest thing to roller coasters that I've ever experienced that is downhill skiing. Oh yeah. So the idea that there are hills. Yeah. And super fans of hills. Yeah. And then that same kind of experience of the flow and the sort of exhaustion and on all these kind of different aspects of the sort of mm. the way and that is combines with the way that the mountain can change mm-hmm. is something that sort of reminds me of the mm. of the experiences that you're describing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the nice thing about ski hills is even even with the artificial side of like snow making etc but there's still like a very real natural aspect of like how the weather shapes the hill it has moods yeah it has mm-hmm. moods yeah whereas roller coasters you get a little bit like when it's raining it goes a little faster like these there's little things but yeah not the same but yeah that could be interesting i like downhill skiing too so if i ended up in a downhill skiing uh music research mode it wouldn't be the worst thing <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for coming and for joining us. Bottom of applause. <laughs>